Thank you, Dwight. And how thankful we are tonight that our relationship with God is not the sinking sands of time, but that our hope is built upon Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, our world is often governed by blame, and no one wants to accept blame anymore. We don't. I want to talk to you tonight about where the blame lies and where the truth actually lives. In our world today, it seems as though people just play this little game all the time. We call it the blame game. You know, even when we have done wrong, we don't like to admit it. And uh, we like to justify, as I mentioned this morning, our sins. And uh, we try to place that responsibility for our sin upon someone else and uh, we're not willing to accept the responsibility for our wrongdoing and that was really kind of a trait from the very onset of life itself for when God made Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden when the devil beguiled Eve and she did sin and God reckoned with she and Adam about their transgressions why, Adam blamed his wife, and his wife blamed the serpent. Neither one of them were willing to accept full responsibility for what they had done in life. And you know, too often in today's world, that is such the case. But a lot of people, sometimes even in business meetings, you hear about men uh, and women going at it, maybe, and and uh, actually blaming one another maybe for a failure in the business or whatever it happens to be. And that is a tragic thing, isn't it? But in reality, you can blame you if you are lost. That's where the blame actually lies. It's not his fault or her fault or their fault. Some people say, not me, you're looking at the wrong person. But everyone wants to blame someone else. I don't care who it is. Sometimes people blame society. But, you know, we live in a social world, and you and I, regardless of what society does, you and I are accountable for our own sin. You remember the story, the parable of the talents that Jesus uh, gave to us? And how he, a man, or the uh, Lord had given one man five talents and another two, and another man, he gave one talent. And the five-talent man and the two-talent man were willing to accept the responsibility of going out and using those talents to the glory of God and to their uh, master. But that one-talent man took what the master had given him and he hid it in the earth he just simply did nothing with it at all. And because he did nothing with it at all, our Lord God was highly displeased. And he said, take what this man had and give to those that had five talents and two talents because they're going to use it in the right way. And he used a multiplicity of words to deny his accountability for what he had done. And I see so much of that in today's world. Everybody wants to place the blame uh, elsewhere instead of accepting responsibility themselves. I know, on the other hand, that sometimes people can place the blame on someone and make them uh, feel that they're on a guilt trip when they don't need to be on a guilt trip. Uh, they have done nothing wrong. And individuals who have done wrong are the ones who sometimes point an accusing finger at someone else. And they will tell them that you are responsible. It's kind of like this little sign I saw the other day. Therapy has taught me that it's all your fault. <laughs> you know, uh, you've been around people like that that believe that uh, they're not responsible at all. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. It was someone else. Anger causes us to blame others for what we are guilty of ourselves. You ever notice that sometimes the guilty party gets mad and gets angry? 
when they are guilty and when that accusing finger is pointed at them with an unwillingness to acknowledge their sin, first of all, and certainly an unwillingness to change their lives. But we have to be very, very careful because when we point that accusing finger at someone else, we have three fingers that are pointing back at us, at you and me. So be very, very careful. In the book of Matthew 6 and 33, Jesus talks about where truth lies. And in the 7th chapter and verse 13, he said, Enter by this narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because narrow is the way, and the gate is difficult, it is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Few. Now, let me tell you who you cannot blame tonight. And you'll find out where the blame lies and where truth lives. I would tell you foremost tonight that you cannot blame God. And you know, a lot of people like to blame God for their mistakes in life. You know, a lot of people feel that God is responsible. Uh, God, if you had allowed me uh, to deal with this in the right way, then I wouldn't have committed this crime. You know, out at Tennessee Colony, I'm told that just about the majority of those who are incarcerated there are people who believe that they are not at fault. And you know what they've done? They've actually told themselves that so long that they don't really believe that they are. But they are accountable. You are accountable for your sin, and you cannot blame God. If you want to look for the answer to who the blame rests with, go to the Bible, to the Word of God. There you will find the answer. In the book of Ephesians 1 and 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And just as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God doesn't want us to be a people that continue to go through life blaming ourselves. But the way that you begin that walk with God is by becoming a Christian, first of all and foremost, and then by repenting of your sin. You see, you'll constantly go through life blaming someone else until you accept responsibility for your own sin and uh, you will continue to blame other people. Notice what he says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory and grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Mark Twain once said, the most popular scapegoat for our sins is God. You know, it's easy to blame God, isn't it? You know, uh, if you've been keeping up with the news over the last few days, a horrible situation that is going on in Surfside, Florida, a terrible situation. The building has collapsed and, and it looks very, very hopeless for many of those people who were incarcerated under that rubble. And it's a terrible thing. And sometimes people rationalize in their mind, they think in their mind, you know, if God really loves me, why would he allow my loved ones to die in this horrible situation? But if you looked at the news recently, you would know that actually the blame goes back to the architectural structure of that building and that they were told back in the year 2018 that it was unsafe. And they continued to allow people to live there. Horrible, horrible situation. But sometimes people want to blame God. I've heard people say that it's an act of God. Even when hurricanes come or tornadic winds blow through our city. And that's happened, I think, five times since I've lived in Palestine. 
And people want to blame Mother Nature, and what they're doing is blaming God. God is the one who is responsible, but that's not where truth lives. It's where blame lies. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have life everlasting. And when Jesus went to the cross, every blow of that hammer and that spike through his body was testimony of his great love for you and for me. Even Jesus had the attitude, think about it, they're nailing him to the cross, and he cries out. He doesn't blame them, but he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sometimes it's hard for us to be forgiving. It's hard for us to feel that we even ought to forgive someone when we find ourselves as a victim of someone else's offense. In 1 Timothy 2, 3, Paul writes and says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. He doesn't want us to be lost. He doesn't. He just wants us to accept responsibility. Do you remember when you were young and, and perhaps maybe your parents caught you in something that you should not have been doing and uh, you didn't really want to own up to it? I think I told you about the mother one time that walked into the kitchen and anyway, she found her little boy up on the table and his hand was in the cookie jar. And the mother said to him, son, what are you doing? And he said, I'm fighting back temptation. <laughs> You know, in life, <laughs> in life, we all have to fight it. You don't have to give in to it. The Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Think about how forgiving God is of you and of me. Jesus taught that unless we are willing to forgive, then we cannot be the recipient of God's forgiveness either. Therefore, we have to repent. We have to change, amend our ways, and then ask God to forgive us. You don't go into the face of God without repenting and asking God to forgive your sin. There is a principle born out in the book of Acts chapter 8 when Simon, having become a Christian, wanted to get his life right with God. He was told by Peter to repent and then pray God that the thought of his heart might be forgiven. You and I have to be penitent. But then there's a second one. You cannot blame Jesus. Don't blame God. And don't blame Jesus. You know, sometimes people call his name in vain. Have you ever heard people say that? Jesus Christ. And they say it in a slang way, a derogatory way. He's not the blame. He is the one who is willing to rescue us from the jaws of eternal hell. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. That's where truth lies. And the Hebrew writer in the second chapter of that book in verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for every man. This translation says every one. Quit blaming Jesus. Jesus did taste death for every person. That we did not have to die a spiritual death and separation from God. And thank God that he didn't just die, but thank God he was raised from the dead. And now he lives and he makes intercession for us at the right hand of God Almighty. In 1 John 3 and 16, by this we know 
love because he laid down his life for us and we ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's where truth lives. Don't blame Jesus. For he offers us, he says, to come unto me all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In Luke 19 and 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Too often, though, we don't want to accept the forgiveness of God and the love of Jesus Christ. And when we don't, we carry that blame around with us all day long. And we carry around the guilt of our sin. When Jesus is ready to receive us and forgive us. Now, one more. I want to tell you this. You cannot blame the Holy Spirit. I would tell you also that the Holy Spirit is a person. Just like God and just like Jesus, he is not a glorified it like a lot of people believe or that it's just some uh, spirit that is floundering out there in the wind. That's not what the Holy Spirit is at all. You remember that when Jesus, getting ready for his own impending death upon the cross, would tell the disciples that he is going to send the comforter. I thought, boy, what a wonderful word. The word comforter from the Greek language is the word paraclete, not parakeet, paraclete. <laughs> and the word paraclete means one who stands by. And Christ and God and the Holy Spirit is standing by us, even when we sin. But he is a person. But you cannot blame the Spirit because he has given us words by which we ought to live. John 14, 26, Jesus said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said unto you. Listen to the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the end of the earth. Now that was a promise not made necessarily to us, but it was made to the disciples. I believe the Holy Spirit lives within us, and Paul acknowledged that in the writing of 1 Corinthians. And he even went on to say in the book of Romans chapter uh, eight that if we don't have the spirit of Christ, he is none of we are none of his. But the spirit of God lives within us, except as Paul says, we be reprobate. For our prophecy, Peter says, came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Spirit. You know when you think about the New Testament not only the New Testament, even the Old Testament as well. It was all spiritually given by the Holy Spirit. For he says, notice this, our prophecy never came by the will of man, but by the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. That's where truth lives. Paul talks about the reception of the Spirit when he says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given unto us by God. These things, he says, we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual you know, the Holy Spirit ought to be a big part of our life. And I'm afraid sometimes people misunderstand the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit. I believe that he is a person. Now, I know a lot of people who say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit completed his work with the writing of the New Testament. And so uh, he's gone back to be with God. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. 
The Bible does teach that he lives within us. 2 Timothy 3, 16, For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, truly equipped unto every good word. I know I'm hitting you with a lot of scripture tonight, but that's what I think you need to hear. <laughs> Revelation 22 and 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Do you realize that every time we offer the invitation of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is the invitation not only of Jesus, not only of the church, but it is an invitation of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he says. And the spirit and the bride, now the word bride there is talking about the church. And the spirit and the bride say come and let him who hears say come and let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. You see, the only person that you can really blame tonight, most people don't want to accept it, but it's true. When you err, or when you sin, the only person you can really blame is self. It just keeps pointing back to you, folks. It does. This is where blame lies and where truth lives. There is no excuse, by the way, for ignorance. You know, sometimes people say, well, I, I sinned in ignorance. How could you sin in ignorance? You ever thought about that? David said one time, keep thou my soul from presumptuous sin. You know what presumptuous sin is? It's willful sin. Have you ever thought about the fact that basically all of the sins that we commit are willful sins? Could you tell me tonight, and you may do that on the way out tonight if you like, tell me what sin would not be a presumptuous sin, a willful sin. You know, I've thought about that for a long, long time. We know that it's a sin to stay ignorant of the Word of God. I've heard people say, well, you know, what about these people that live in the dark regions of Africa? The Bible says we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that Christ is coming with vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. If those people are going to be saved, why don't we just quit preaching to the world? Why don't we just all go to heaven in ignorance? God doesn't teach that. That's why. But don't blame God. He's given us his word whereby we can understand it and comprehend it and obey it. When Paul went to Athens, Greece, he said profoundly on Mars Hill in Acts 17, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Pretty poignant, isn't it? He gets to the point. Let all men repent. And that means to change, folks. It doesn't mean to be sorry for your sin. I think a lot of times people get mixed up, but the book of Romans 2 and 4 says that godly sorrow worketh repentance. Godly sorrow is not the same thing as repentance. It brings it about. 2 Thessalonians, you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that do not know God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and our Savior Jesus. And the Bible says that they will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And I'm quite sure that on the day of judgment that people will clamor and say, God, if you really love me, why did you allow me to go to hell? And God will say, I warned you over and over. Perhaps he might say, do you remember Dan Manuel's sermon on June the 27th on a Sunday night? Mm -hmm. 
No temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with that temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. We all ought to pray this prayer. Dear God, I don't ask you to make my life easier, but I ask you to give me the strength to face all of my problems, and I accept the blame for what I have done. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will come to Christ in that last day, blaming God or Christ or the Holy Spirit. And they will say, we've cast out demons in your name, and we've done all these great things in your name. And then I will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness or iniquity. But therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded upon the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You see, God is saying unto us, do not just listen to the word. Do what it says. That's where truth lies. That's where truth lives. Real truth. Don't place the blame on someone else. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You remember when Jesus walked on troubled waters and he came to where Peter was? Now Peter was going to get out of the boat and walk to him. But he took his eyes off Jesus. Folks, let me tell you, we need to keep our eyes on Christ. We need to keep watching him. Today he comes to us who are on our troubled sea of life. He comes to receive the confession that he's made all men to make, that he is the Son of God. And he waits. He waits for us to be obedient in baptism. You can't blame the nursing habits of your mother when you stand in judgment. You can't blame what your boss did. You can't blame anyone but ourselves. And the question tonight is, what are you going to do? Are you going to take the narrow road? that leads to life? Or will you continue to walk the broad way that leads to eternal hell? Christ said to be thou faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Quit halting between two opinions. It's either yes or no. That's the bottom line. And we should say as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Dwight's going to lead us in a song of encouragement and exhortation if tonight you're here in this audience and you need to come to Jesus. I hope you'll do it. Quit blaming and come while we stand and while we sing.